Okay, um, we are back for topic 2.5. Uh, very exciting topic referring to natural disruptions to ecosystems. Um, and again, sticking to that overarching topic for unit two, which is that ecosystems have structure and diversity that change over time. Um, so by natural disruptions to ecosystems, right? Um, one of the things we have to understand, you know, so we, we talk a lot about human impacts on systems. One thing to, to keep in mind as we go through, uh, not just this unit, but this entire year, is that geologic history is full of major global changes, which are then accompanied by major changes in life. Um, so the, the climate changes uh, throughout history from ice ages to interglacials to extreme ice ages to extreme warm climates. Um, the breakup of Pangaea uh, had all kinds of uh, impacts on both climate and diversity of life. Uh, intensive volcanic activity has occurred in geologic history. Uh, meteorite impacts have happened. Um, so and one of the things to understand is like uh, extinction of species happens, right? Sometimes it's, it's massive and global. Sometimes it's localized. Sometimes it's just sort of this ongoing process. Um, and what we're going to look at throughout this uh, set of notes is what are, what are some of the types of disruptions uh, that might happen and what are their implications for our ecosystems in terms of their ability to cope with those changes or not. So uh, one thing, we don't need to delve into the geologic timeline uh, too deeply at this point, um, but just understand that the Earth is exceptionally old by our standards, right? And then in fact, a lot of Earth's history really didn't have much life to begin with. It took a long time and Earth changes, global changes, uh, to even set the stage for life to begin, all right? But if we look back at the history of Earth and the history of life on Earth, we can kind of see uh, uh, an organization that we could put into place to kind of recognize when major changes happened on Earth, right? And so the way the geologic timeline is structured is by eons, all right? So we kind of have the, the Precambrian and the Phanerozoic eons. Those are like our, our longest timelines. And then those can be split up into eras. So we have the Paleozoic. Um, so after this sort of... Uh, Precambrian area. We have these areas of the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. Mesozoic, uh, of course, would be most famous to most of us because that's the time of the dinosaurs. All right. Then within those eras, we have periods. So, for example, going back to the Mesozoic, we have the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Uh, so that popular movie uh, Jurassic Park, for example, is kind of referring to that period. Um, although many of the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, the movie, were from the Cretaceous period, so it might have been more aptly named Cretaceous Park. Maybe that doesn't quite roll off the tongue quite like Jurassic Park it does. Uh, but, and then uh, we have what are called epochs, all right? So in the Mesozoic, they're, they're not very creative in just having early, middle, and late epochs. Um, but getting into more re recent history, we have what's called like uh, the Holocene epoch, which is uh, essentially where we are now. All right, so eons are the longest, followed by eras and periods, and then epochs being the shortest timeline. So um, disruptions, right, uh, happen relatively frequently at the local level. All right, so like wildfires and floods and you know uh, minor volcanic eruptions. Uh, these, I mean, you'll you'll experience several of these just throughout your lifetime. Right, these happen in local areas and don't have a whole lot of noise on the global scale. Like even those crazy wildfires we had uh, just this last summer uh, that impacted air quality so badly. I mean, on this term of, of the, the, the globe as a whole, right, it was a fairly localized event. Okay, but some disruptions are truly global. Right, so uh, ice ages, for example, impact the entire global climate. Uh, major volcanic eruptions, so uh, the types that occur maybe every few hundred thousand years, right? those can actually put enough particles in the air to uh, cause like little mini mini ice ages, all right? And, uh, and God forbid, but they do happen, are major meteor impacts 
Um, those are huge uh, changes to the, the entire global system that can have uh, impacts on all living organisms on the planet. All right. Um, so we're going to kind of differentiate between periodic natural disruptions, episodic, episodic natural disruptions, and totally random ones. So periodic disruptions, uh, they occur on periodic time intervals. Um, so more or less, right, glacial and interglacial cycles, at least for the past million years or so, have followed a fairly periodic regular pattern, all right? And along with that, um, changes in sea level have occurred on a very, very similar pattern. So the graph you see off to the right here shows uh, temperatures over time, right? So the high points would be our interglacial periods, low points, would be our ice ages, right? And it's not a, a beautiful uh, periodic pattern, but they do occur kind of on a scale of every 100,000 years. We'll go from an interglacial period into an ice age and then back to an interglacial period approximately every 100,000 years. And sea level tends to follow uh, much the same suit. So if you look at the blue line here, notice that we have high temperatures. We also have high sea levels, and that's because the melting of our polar ice, at least some of it, uh, causes a lot more water to go into the ocean, which raises sea level. It's also a function of the fact that we're warming the ocean up, which expands the ocean a little bit. Okay? Um, and so one thing um, to, to remember is that our climate has varied significantly in the past, and so has sea level. Right, um, and those are tied together uh, a lot because of the amount of ice. For uh, a colder global climate, right, when uh, water evaporates off the ocean and falls in the form of snow, it tends to stay uh, in our glaciers and grow those glaciers, thereby shrinking the oceans and lowering sea level. When it warms up and we melt those glaciers and ice caps, that causes sea level to rise again. Okay, those are relatively periodic, although uh, over extensive or long periods of time. Um, so natural disruptions can also be episodic, which means that they do occur uh, occasionally, but there's no like set pattern or period to them. They just sort of uh, uh, occur occasionally, but at infrequent in intervals. And those are things that we're commonly familiar with, like wildfires. Uh, El Nino and La Nino are the uh, ENSO cycles. Um, we'll talk about those more later this year, but uh, they're just periods of time when the ocean surface temperature is warmer versus colder, and those have some climatic implications uh, for certain parts of the world, right? But those don't occur on a regular period, right? They might be every two years to every seven years. Um, and extreme weather, right? Every year there's some extreme weather, but there's no like set pattern to it. They're not, not so much periodic. All right. And then we can have natural disruptions that are entirely random. Um, there's no uh, set periodicity or, or particular pattern or frequency to them. And those would be like our meteorite impacts. All right. Now, the, the, the lesson being here is that natural disruptions can be relatively small and localized and maybe impact a small uh, ecosystem in a small way. Um, but natural disruptions can be huge and change the entire global system. Right? It sort of depends on the severity of it, how quickly that change occurs, et cetera. So, um, so kind of the, the lesson to life Right? So if, if a species wants to uh, withstand the test of time, that means that species has to withstand the test of uh, changes and disruptions to their environment, whatever may cause those. All right. So if the environment changes, now whether that's naturally induced, like those examples we just talked about, or human induced, species have to be able to uh, adapt, right? which means that the, within their population, they have genetic traits that allow at least some members to cope with that change, okay? Um, okay, they have to uh, be able to migrate to a new area with a suitable environment. Or, right, if they can't do either of those things, right, some species end up going extinct, right? There's just that natural uh, story of life in Earth's history is over time, species come, and they go, right? 
Some species have been around for a much longer time than others, um, which means that they are well suited to either being able to adapt or migrate, right? Uh, some species have, have had a relatively short period of time on the Earth, um, which means maybe they were highly specialized for a, a certain habitat at a certain time. So if you look at the example of the Arctic fox, right? Um, it is very, very well suited for its current environment. But um, if that environment shrinks or disappears altogether, the Arctic fox probably doesn't have the right types of genetic uh, traits to allow it to uh, uh, move to a different habitat, right? It essentially has well suited to a snowy, icy habitat. Not so much uh, if that habitat disappears. Okay, um, now moving forward, so we, there's natural disruptions to ecosystems. And so the story of Earth is full of what we call background extinction, which essentially is species coming and going with no particular uh, abrupt change in life. Uh, there are also periods of time of what we call mass extinctions. So uh, there and maybe is a, a global event or a sudden rapid event that um, much of the life on Earth is not able to cope with. Even if they might have been a generalist species, the changes might have been so dramatic or so profound or occurred so quickly that they couldn't adapt. All right. Um, and so we call those mass extinctions. And there's been about five throughout history. So at the end of the Ordovician, when about 50 percent of animal families died out. The end of the Devonian with about 30%. The most uh, scariest or most prominent one was at the end of the Permian, where 90% of terrestrial animal families and 95% of marine species were wiped out. Right? Uh, in fact, there was just within the last uh, couple of weeks, they finally uh, mapped out the kind of sequence of events that occurred to cause that. If we have time in class one day, we might read about that. Um, there's the end of the Triassic. Uh, when many of our uh, animal families died, including some uh, dinosaurs, but the end of the Cretaceous is kind of that really famous one. That's when all dinosaurs died out. Now, uh, what you may have noticed, so that's five mass extinctions that have occurred uh, throughout geologic history. And we call them mass when it was basically a sudden and drastic decrease in the number of uh, uh, animal and plant families existing on the planet. Right. Notice that this graphic right here shows another extinction event occurring right now. There is a current extinction crisis um, that is if the rate, current rate of uh, animal and plant extinctions continues, um, we will match many of those past mass extinctions. And kind of the big uh, starting point of that is the Holocene about 10,000 years ago, right? Um, so basically, just as glaciers uh, began to retreat and our climate uh, moderated to this uh, relatively warm period that we're experiencing, that was good for humans, good for agriculture, and good for lots of uh, organisms. So uh, it's about the time that human civilization and agriculture started taking place, right? Um, there's a rapid extinction of what they call large megafauna. Fauna, by the way, is referring to animals, flora, referring to plants, flora and fauna, right? The megafauna are like large mammoths and some of those creatures you might have seen like in the movie Ice Age or whatever. Um, so around 10,000 years ago, we started seeing a major change in life, and that has accompanied uh, a massive increase in the number of human beings, all right? Uh, and so some uh, scientists are uh, advocating that, you know, we've we're out of the Holocene now, and we've begun what's called what they want to call the Anthropocene epoch, right? In which case, we're experiencing such a, a profound change to the Earth, right? Um, that they feel like it's worthy of becoming a new epoch, right? And what's causing this profound change in this case is, in fact, humans. That anthro uh, prefix right there is referring to humans. Um, and so, if you look at the major global changes that are occurring right now, uh, human beings are presently the dominant force of global change, right? We're changing the chemistry of the ocean. We're changing the chemistry of the atmosphere. We're changing the way energy entering our atmosphere interacts with that system. 
uh, causing things to heat up. Uh, and so many of the, the, the thousands of species that are going extinct currently uh, as we speak uh, are because of habitat fragmentation and destruction and invasive species brought about by the movement of humans around the development that humans are causing. All right, so a little something to think about as we move forward. Uh, natural disruptions can be as big as or greater than human disruptions, and it's important to remember that Earth's history is full of them, but the major dominant cause of change, global change that we're experiencing right now, now is human activity.